how do we change that? Can you hear me now? Any good? Wicked. Cool, that's good. Oh, hey. John Keith, thanks for tuning in again. Um, and Keith, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, today, so yeah, um, sorry, you won't have heard anything that I said in the last four and a half minutes. Um, or the bit at the beginning where I was just tuning up. So, uh, welcome back to Folky Fridays. This is number 49. Um, I'll have to think of something special to do for number 50. Um, I can't believe I've done 50 of these already, it's mad. The topic today is um, what makes Celtic music sound Celtic and more specifically what makes Irish music sound Irish because that's mainly what I talk about on this channel um, and we may also have a look at um, what differentiates it from Scottish music and where they overlap. Um, obviously geographical history plays a big part in this as well. Um, I'm not tremendously knowledgeable on history because my memory for dates and um, notable people is very very poor but um, I will try and weave some of that in as well if there's anything that I can actually remember the details of. Um, to start out with there's a few there's a few features which just by playing along with Celtic music for a certain amount of time you will will notice to be common to to most tunes. Um, I'm going to be mainly talking about Irish tunes but this applies also to Scottish tunes and to a lesser extent which I will go into in a bit to uh, Welsh and Breton music as well. Um, with regards to Irish tunes then, the first thing that makes um, Irish music sound like Irish music is that it's modal. Um, in melodic terms it's all based in um, four modes. You've got Ionian which is the major scale, you've got Dorian which is like um, a minor type scale with a flattened third but it's got an optimistic sixth like in a major scale and a flattened seventh as in all minor scales. Um, then you've got Aeolian which is a dark miserable version of Dorian where the sixth is flattened as well and you've got Mixolydian. And there's some really interesting reasons why it might be that um, Irish music is modal. Personally I think it's because um, the modes or basically the major scale um, most of the notes within the major scale, seventh notwithstanding, but all the others are made as simple ratios. So if you have one frequency that you hear, you're always going to interpret um, the rest of the melody in relation to your root pitch. And what your ears are doing, if you're just hearing a melody, no accompaniment, your ear has got a kind of inbuilt memory of what the root note is and it's comparing all the other notes to that root note. This is my, my opinion on it anyway. I mean, I'm not a neuroscientist or a musicologist, so maybe don't quote me on this to your more scientifically minded friends. But my opinion is that this must be how it works. Um, so you've got a kind of memory of what the root pitch is and you're interpreting the other notes that come in based on that root pitch. And the interval between the root pitch and those other notes is what is going to make your ear feel a certain way. The other thing that your ear is doing is comparing it in its short-term memory to the notes that came before it um, in order to form a kind of contour. So you're kind of hearing a melody that's a bit like a line graph going like this, you know. Um, and then the relationship between the line at any given point is sort of how your ear is determining... Um, how to feel about the progression of that line, if you like, and that's that's where your melody's coming from. With Celtic music, because it's all because its roots are sort of prehistoric in a way. I mean, to call it Celtic music is a misnomer, really, because it's got nothing probably to do with the Celts. But what I'm talking about is what we refer to in modern terms as Irish traditional music, which was kind of collected in the 
from the 1700s on, I suppose. Um, and of course, like the most famous Irish collections now are things like O'Neill's and books like that, which were from the 18 and 1800s. Um, so, um, but these these tunes are sort of fairly recent. However, there's lots of people that have studied um, older music than that and tried to piece together what melodies may have been used in those. And broadly speaking, the the consensus is that they were also pretty much modal. Um, if you want to find some really interesting evidence about that, by the way, look up a guy called Dr. Andreas Hurt, A-I-N-D-R-I-A-S. He's got some really interesting theories on um, looking at Fenian lays, which are obviously much older in their provenance than the music I'm talking about, um, and arguing about them potentially being in a different scale, which is not based in the modes, which I won't go into, but it's very, very interesting if you like that sort of thing. Go and check him out. You can find all his research for free on the internet as well. Um, anyway, sorry, I've got sidetracked. What was I talking about? So, they're, they're all modal anyway, that's my point. And um, the reasons for that are that you've got a lot of diatonic instruments or um, instruments like a fiddle where you've got one simple scale fingering that gives you a D major scale starting from the D string or a G major scale starting from the G string. Um, and then taking that same fingering or the same set of notes, and if you're on a you know a tin whistle or a, a kind of pipe instrument like that, you can obviously only play um, maybe like two two and a half octaves of a of a given scale, I suppose, um, however many it is. Um, so you've only got one particular scale, one particular major scale as a starting point, and then starting from different notes within that and finishing from the same note, you come up with the other modes of that scale. I have my own theories as to why um, it's Ionian, Dorian, Mixed Lydian and Aeolian that are used in Celtic music and not Lydian, which is uh, the fourth one, which is a very natural sounding mode to my ears. I don't. It seems strange that um, Celtic music doesn't use that mode as well. Um, I'm not going to go into why that might be, but again, Andreas Hertz got some interesting theories on that. Um, it might have something to do with the church having a big impact on banning a lot of the modes, but then you would have thought that the Dorian and the Mixlydian would have disappeared as well. So I'm not really too sure on why we don't use um, Lydian, Phrygian. I know why we don't use Locrian, it's because it sounds awful. Um, <laughs> starts on a diminished chord, not just not nice sounding. Anyway, so going back to the modes that we do use, um, the very early roots of this kind of music are from a time where it was mainly melody instruments. There weren't any guitars, obviously, because guitars arrived from Spain in fairly recent history. Um, there weren't any banjos, because they were from Africa, um, again, fairly recently in the grand scheme of things. Um, and obviously accordions, no. Um, so instruments that played chords were not really involved um, in the roots of this kind of music. It was melodic and accompaniment probably would have been other melody instruments playing that. Um, so it would have been very, very simple in its accompaniment. And that meant that um, the considerations that you'd put into composing a classical piece as to if I put a certain note in a certain bar, will that define a certain chord, for example? Those considerations are modern things and wouldn't really have any influence on composers of these kind of tunes that we see as being the traditional repertoire now. Um, so you get certain melodic conventions which are for the sake of the melody and mean that the harmony is very simple. Um, generally speaking, if you're listening to an Irish tune, you will not find bits where it sounds like it needs chord five, apart from in the last bar of a section. And that's why I always talk about the seventh foot tap. You know, you've got like, if I hum a tune, um, let me think of a nice traditional one. Um, um, Uh, 
da 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 da. A bit of a mind blank. Um, Okay, my brain's not working today, sorry, I've um, been flat out all day with the shop being reopened now and I'm very, very tired, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit. It doesn't really matter anyway, my point is that um, there's very, there's not going to be any sections where it sounds like it needs chord 5, apart from on the 7th foot tap. Um, what makes it sound like it needs chord 5, or like it needs another chord, is what notes are on the dominant beats in a bar. And it tends to be with Irish music um, that the notes on the dominant beats are notes from chord one in most places. I'll dig into that a little bit more. I've got a diagram here somewhere which will help me um, show you what I'm talking about with this. Um, if I can find the right notebook. Oh, here it is. Here we go. So, in chord one, the notes are one, three, one, three, and five, the red ones from the major scale. Those are the notes that appear in chord one. So if we're in the key of G, for example, um, chord one is G major, the notes in it are G, B, and D. G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp. Um, in chord four, you've got notes four, six, and the root note again because um, those are the ones that would appear in, uh, in chord 4 in G major, which would be C, so C, E, and G, the green ones. And in chord 5, you've got 5, um, 7, and 2, the blue ones. So if you hear a bar in which um, there is a note 7, for example, the seventh note only appears in chord five, and if you hear a bar where the seventh note is on a dominant beat, it's very clear that that bar needs chord five with it. However, um, in Irish music, that doesn't happen. The only place you find the seventh note, generally, if you're in a major key, is going to be in the last bar. Or if you hear it anywhere else, it'll be a very short note and probably not on a dominant beat of the bar. Um... That's generally true, 90% of the time. The reason for that is that, going back to what I was saying before about simple ratios, within a major scale, um, the most simple ratio is an octave, two oscillations to one. A fifth is um, fairly simple as well, that's three, three oscillations to two. Um, a major third is fairly simple as well, that's um, four to three, um, and so on. And if you go through the simple the simple ratios and then you make chords, oh, a fourth is also very simple, so you've got one, three, four, five as your kind of most simple options. And then if you make um, chords from those, so four up to six, that's how you get your sixth, um, and six up to two, that's how you get your... Uh, sorry, um, oh, the major second is is the next simplest after the after the third after the fourth. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, it's nine to eight. Okay, well, it's fairly simple anyway. It's not really it's not really um, super important right now. But um, if you go up a f if you go up a fifth from the fifth, you get a second. So you're a simple ratio from one of your simple ratios gives you a second. So these are all these are all kind of notes that, if played against a root, would sound fairly okay with it. And that's what I'm talking about when I say that you're um, kind of remembering what the root note is and comparing the others, if you like. Um, So that gives you all of your notes in the major scale, apart from the 7th, 
The seventh compared to the root note, I've got it written on the wall somewhere. Um, oh no, I haven't. The seventh compared to the root note, I can't remember what the what the ratio is, but it's something exceptionally high, which means that if you play a seventh and a root note together, um, a lot of the time their two waveforms will be cancelling each other out, which means you get a kind of jaggedy sound wave coming into your ear, which doesn't sound very harmonious. So you've got like a... If I play it to you... That's a major seventh. Yeah. You've got a really nasty sounding... Uncomfortable interval there. Um, you end up with it in the major scale because it's... Um, because it's um, in chord 5, I suppose. Um, a major third above chord 5 is your is your 7th note, so you, you need a major 7th in order to get chord 5. Um, if we're talking in terms of old melodic music though, there isn't any chord 5, therefore there isn't really a need to include this nasty nasty sounding interval, which if you're just thinking compared to the root note, sounds nasty, there's no need to have it. And that tends to be a thing, is that you hardly ever find the seventh note in, in Celtic tunes in major keys, because it's purely melody based. This is this is what I think anyway. Um, yeah. Where you do find it, however, is you find it cropping up usually in the last bars of sections, because um, having that momentary tension towards the end of a section and then resolving it by um, going to a more comfortable note within the scale, usually the root note, kind of um, is a satisfying thing to do. You know, a section in a tune is kind of like building up tension and then resolving it at the end. And that's pretty much what all music is in one way or another. It kind of winds you up in some way and then it kind of fixes itself at the end and you go, ah, you know, um, but anyway, yeah, that's, um, that's why I think that the seventh is rarely there in a, in a major key and that you, um, will reflect the fact that it appears generally on the seven, around the seventh foot tap by putting your chord five there and resolving that back to chord one. And the reason chord five to chord one sounds resolved as well is because notes five, seven and two from the major scale are the notes that make up chord five um, so you're putting that major seventh in there which is uncomfortable and then you're fixing it by putting it back to the root note in chord one um, just on the subject of the modes if I write um, the intervals onto this little diagram so the, mo the intervals within a major scale are tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 um, semitone at the end. Something like that. That's the intervals within the scale. And the thing that makes... Um, purely melody based music feel like it wants to move in a certain way if i go da 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 it wants to go da da dum it wants to carry on going up the the thing that makes it feel like it's being sucked into the next note in the melody sometimes is where the semitone gaps are within your scale i've i've already kind of said um maybe in a bit of a rushed way today, but I have covered it before in other videos, um, roughly why we have the divisions of the scale how we do. It's because of the ratios between the root notes, the root note to the notes within the scale, and the ratios between the notes within the scale, that you end up with this set of divisions being the most harmonious possible divisions of an octave. Um, so... With this set of divisions, where the semitones between the notes are, you end up with a note that kind of wants to suck into the following one. So if you play da da dum, 
it wants to go into chord four because um, there's a semitone gap there leading it into the next one. And likewise, when you get to seven, da 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 da, it wants to go da dum up into eight. I'm sorry if you can't see this, by the way. I appreciate it's quite bright in here, and it's. I hope my diagram's not being ghosted. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's not much I could do about that at the moment. Cause it's so it's unusually sunny in Sheffield today. So uh, yeah, um, hopefully you can read this. Hold it a bit closer. Maybe that'll help. Um, mirror image. There we go. Ah, yeah. There we go. So yeah, with these semitones, if you're thinking of your um, your melody, da 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 dum, you tend to find that whenever there's a seven, it's very unstable and it wants to go back to the root note, and it generally does that in the last bars of sections. And likewise, if there's a four, if you've got like a strong four um, on a dominant beat in a tune, then that kind of feels uncomfortable, and that's a chord four section. That's where it feels like it's kind of gone away somewhere. And what you tend to find is that um, if you've got a chord four section, it'll then lead up into five and you've got your chord five section and that leads you back round to one. And that's why you kind of get this one, 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 four, four, five, one kind of structure that you get in a lot of Celtic tunes because of where the semitone gaps are. Um, in guitar playing terms, just on the subject of chords, if I play like G... And then I play chord three, which is, if you recall, it's the one three is the third note in the scale has a semitone that leads it into four. Um, so if I play um, one and then three, it'll want to lead into four like this. It kind of seems natural if I play the third chord followed by the fourth chord. So G, then B minor wants to go into C. And even more, if I play chord 7, the diminished chord, it really sounds like it needs to go back to chord 1. If we look at D, which is chord 5, there's my root note D, and there's my major third of D, which is F sharp. F sharp compared to the root note, which is G, is the major seventh, so that really wants to go. From F sharp back to G, which is why chord five goes back to chord one. That makes everything sound finished. Um, let's take this pattern of tones and semitones then and have a think about where those semitones are in the other modes, because that has some interesting um, implications. Oh, just quickly, why am I talking about this in relation to Irish music? Because in more modern music, where they were thinking of adding harmonic instruments and where the harmony could be built into the melody, um, if I take an English tune, like... Um, uh, oh, I was playing one before. Um, English, English music has um, sevenths spotted about all over the place and where the sevenths are, if you listen to like a Morris dance tune you'll find the seventh and where the seventh is you'll put a chord five. So there's one. Um, so there's my major seventh. Ending on A, so there we're not on a we're not on a seventh foot tap, but there's a seventh in the tune, 
therefore it has to be a chord 5 section. But you don't get that in Irish tunes, and I think it's probably because um, because of the fact that um, melodic accompaniment has only been, harmonic accompaniment rather, has only been a more recent addition in the Irish stuff. Um, so outlining chords in the tune isn't really done. The conventions that are adhered to are um, you stick within one mode, you don't deviate from it, apart from in one case, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, you move in small jumps, so if you go um, something like that, the biggest gaps that you're going to do are adjacent notes within the scale, or thirds, or potentially fourths, or potentially fifths, but they're quite rare. And if you do a jump bigger than a third, you often find um, that um, after a big jump, the tune changes direction. So if I take Morrison's Jig as an example. So we've got root to fifth, back again, adjacent notes, root to fifth, then we're going up the scale, um, we go up the scale, we come down the scale, then we go down a third, and down another third. So it's all, there is a fifth at the beginning, but it changes direction after the big jump, and then it's all thirds and adjacent notes. And those kind of conventions are true for pretty much all Irish music. And I think, and as well for most Celtic music, um, and I think that's because if your brain is trying to process just a melody on the basis of a root note, it's easier to, it also needs to know what the notes near it were and how it relates to those. And brains are much better at processing small gaps because they're easier to compute than a great big leap, you know. Um, you can test this yourself. If you, if you play yourself intervals, like a major third, your ear's going to be pretty good at recognising, oh, that's, that's the sound of a major third. That's the sound of a second. This is the sound of a fifth. If I play those same intervals and I move them up an octave, um, that's a third. That's a second. That's a fifth. You might find that your, you may not, depending how good your ears are, but you might find that you find it harder to detect what they are when they're an octave away. Um, so yeah. But anyway, um, so yeah, we we tend to move in small jumps, and then thirds or fifths, occasionally an octave. Uh, if there's a big jump, you often change direction. That's the kind of conventions of um, Irish music. And also, if you're, going to, if you're in a major key and you're going to have the seventh note, it's going to appear in the last bars of sections. If you're in the other modes then, um, if we were in the Dorian mode, for example, we'd be taking our pattern of intervals, but we'd be starting from the second within relative to the major scale. So if we had a C major scale, and we started and finished from D, we'd be in the key of D, Dorian. Um, so your semitones are in a different place now, um, and you'll find that your chords kind of reflect that. So um, if I'm in D, Dorian, for example, there is no great imperative. If I play chord 7, there's no huge imperative to go back to chord 1, because it's a tone away now, it's not, it's not an uncomfortable semitone away. Um, so if you're in um, D minor, D Dorian, um, then you play C natural, which is your, your 7 chord, that's quite comfortable, whereas chord 7 in a major key is like a no-no and very uncomfortable. Um, and that's why sometimes if you're in a minor key, you can put chord 7 or chord 5 in sections other than um, other than the bit at the end of the at the end, the seventh foot tap bit you can put those chords in other places as well because they're not half as uncomfortable as they would be in uh, in in a major key um, where the semitones are if you're in Dorian is between two and three 
So if I play, if I was in A Dorian playing along with like the Cliffs of Moha or something like that, if I play B minor, it wants to go up into C. And actually, you, you tend to find, I didn't mention this before, but you tend to find that the ones, the chords that are before the semitones, um, actually you probably, if you play them, they don't sound that good. Um, so if I was in A Dorian, I wouldn't play B minor, I'd play the first inversion of G instead. <laughs> Sounds a lot nicer, but um, that's kind of by the by, I suppose. Um, de -de -de -de. Um, the other one, if I was in, if I was in, if I'm in A Dorian, we've got a semitone between um, chord six up to chord seven. There's my chord six, and it wants to go into chord seven. Like that. Here's an interesting thing. If you're in Dorian, um, you've got a flattened third, and you've got um, a flattened seventh, but you've got a normal sixth. So there's a semitone between the sixth and the seventh in Dorian. If you're in Aeolian, on the other hand, your sixth is flattened, so there's a semitone not between the sixth and the seventh, but between the fifth and the sixth. And that means if I play the same chord progression, chord one in A minor, followed by chord six, um, if I'm in Dorian, there's my raised sixth. That's a, um, an inversion of it's a, a D with a thumb, which is a substitute for F sharp diminished. I can play F sharp diminished. That wants to lead into G because my semitone is pointing upwards. If I was in um, A Aeolian, I've got F. That's F is now my chord six because the seventh is flattened. And that one, the semitone is pointing down to the fifth. So if I'm in Aeolian, I get this dark. the kind of tendency of the chords um, and if I'm in Dorian I get something more positive like that and all that is just because of the power of the semitone gaps let's move on to Mixolydian because I, I said before there was um, some funny business with sevenths um, which I'd come on to if you're in Mixolydian the Mixolydian mode is like a major scale, but the seventh note's flattened. That means that your semitone is between six and seven, and seven back to one is a tone. Now, this is a funny thing about the major scale, is that in the major scale, you've got the major seventh, which is a very unstable interval compared to the root note. It's basically not very harmonious at all if you play it alongside the root note, and that's what makes it really want to resolve back to one. The flattened seventh, on the other hand, is quite harmonious. It's a simpler frequency ratio than the, the major seventh. So if I play a note, here's its major seventh with it. And here's its flattened seventh, which is a lot nicer. So you can, you can hear it straight away. The, the flattened seventh is a much more natural sound. And that's why when you're in Mixolydian, it's very comfortable to use this, the flat seventh in the melody. And people tend to use it in the melody a lot because it is what makes it clearly different from a major tune. What makes it interesting, really. Um, so they tend to throw them in there a lot. So if you've got a tune like... Um, there's my seventh. seventh was in there quite a lot um, 
the semitones in that one then are between um, chord six. So if we're in D mixolydian, chord six is B minor, and that wants to lead up to chord seven because there's a semitone separating the two. So if I play. <laughs> there it kind of sounds natural for it to come back up again and the other place there's a semitone in mixed Lydian is like in the major scale you've got between the third and the fourth a semitone pointing upwards so there it is there and how many times do you hear folk guitarists do this kinds of things, or if you're in mixing. That kind of thing. So your your semitone between the third and the fourth is still effective in mixolydian. That has two interesting properties. Number one is that because the seventh isn't really wanting to lead back to one, when you play chord five, Chord 5 doesn't have a strong pressure to lead back to chord 1, and nor does chord 7. And that's because chord 5 in Mixolydian is A minor, A, C, and E. Um, so chord 5 there has that flattened 7th from the D scale in it, which is the C. Um, and that has no strong pressure to go back to D. So 5, 1 doesn't sound that resolved in Mixolydian. It doesn't really sound that much like it's an ending. <laughs> It sort of does because we're used to doing it at the ends of Mixolydian tunes, but but in terms of like pure feeling, if you'd never played any music or heard any music before, I'm sure you would agree that that sounds less finished than that does, or, or that. Um, what does sound quite finished in Mixolydian is going from chord 3 up to chord 4. So if I was playing a tune in D mixolydian, there are a lot of times where it might actually sound nice to end a section on chord 4 instead of chord 1, because it actually, because of the kind of placement of the semitones, in some ways it can sound more finished. And I'll, just because I find it quite interesting, I'll demonstrate this with um, one of the Folk Friend play-alongs. Um, just bear with me a minute, I'll find a, a nice Mixolydian one I can show you this with. Uh, Got a Mixolydian one somewhere? Let's see. Choice Wife, D Mixolydian, here we go. If you want to look at the Folk Friend play-alongs, by the way, they give you like three versions of the chords on screen for every tune and a write-up of the music theory. Um, you do have to pay for them, but you get 20 for 25 quid, which is absolutely loads of tunes to practice along with, all at three different speeds, on-screen karaoke chords, chord diagrams, uh, a write-up of how the theory works and how you can take things from them and use them for your backing in other tunes. So they're, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm biased because I made them, but they really are quite good. Go and go and buy them if you uh, like the channel and you want to um, help me not starve. <laughs> um, you can get them on this link, which I will put in the chat in just a second. Thanks, Chonky. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I thought it might be a bit conceptual today, but um, I'm glad you're finding it interesting. So yeah, here's, um, here's a, a tune in mixed Lydian, and I'm, I'm going to go from um, I'm going to go from chord three, which is like D over F sharp, D with a thumb, and end a section on G just to show you that it sounds nice, but only in mixed Lydian.
so that was ev at the end of every line I was putting in G which is chord 4 instead of ending on chord 1 and that just works in Mixolydian because of that placement of the uh, the, the semitones um, yeah so that's that's uh, one thing that I thought was interesting um, there's another thing which stems from this lack of harmonic accompaniment as well which is or potentially it stems from the nature of the scales um, but anyway yeah in in minor keys in Dorian and Aeolian tunes um, there's very rarely a sixth and the reason for that is that um, what would have been the uncomfortable interval, the major seventh, the note that is most uncomfortable in relation to the root note, in the major key, in a major scale, if you think about the Dorian mode, it's like you've got that same set of intervals, but you're starting and finishing from the second note, which means that what used to be the seventh is now the sixth. Um, so the sixth offset against um, the other notes within the scale is quite a kind of uncomfortable note there. Um, if you are in the Aeolian so if I was in E Aeolian my sixth is uh, C sharp so that doesn't really sound too comfortable together. I mean, it's a minor, it's a minor third if you're taking the lower one as the root note, or it's uh, or it's um, uh, you know a major sixth the other way around. If you think about um, in the Aeolian mode where that sixth is flattened, that is a major third from the lower one to the root note, so that's quite comfortable that way round, um, but if you play a root note and you play the sixth against it, I don't think it's a very comfortable sound at all. That kind of just sounds like it, like that sixth needs to resolve because it's pointing down a semitone to the fifth, much more consonant. <laughs> then you've become M&M &M. um, but yeah anyway so um, the si anyway my point is the sixth is not really a very a very comfortable interval in either the Dorian or the Aeolian um, and that's why it doesn't really crop up much in the um, in the um, in the minor keys. Oh, thank you, Jared. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I will. Well, I will do. I'll, I'll be doing lots more. Yeah. If you've got any suggestions for um, content you'd like to see as well, just um, drop me an email. It's info at fina um, well either info at finaleguitar.co.uk or info at folkfriend.co.uk. Um, but yeah, any excuse to waffle about music theory, I'm always on it. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. So the the sixth is quite an uncomfortable interval, and so in the in the two minor modes, you don't hear the sixth in them that much. You'll hear lots of tunes. If I go back to Morrison's jig, no six so far. There's one, but only for a second. And no sixth anywhere in that whole section. So there's one sixth in the whole of the A part there. So that's an example, but this is like a universal convention within Irish and Scottish and general Celtic music as well. More so in Irish though, and Scottish. Um, so um, yeah, you don't get six very much, and that means that you can mix and match between um, Aeolian and Dorian chords, and I've talked a lot in previous videos about ways that you can do that, um, but I just thought you might find it interesting why, why that is. Um, people generally, people that are modern <laughs> modern day human beings and have grown up listening to music where harmonies are included 
People generally tend to plump for the Aeolian style chords, even to go with Dorian tunes. Um, you might... So, for example, if you're in E, if you're in E minor, you'd probably find them using A minor. They'll probably find that more kind of sounds right in their head as the right harmony to go with a tune in E Dorian. So Morrison's. There's an A minor. So those are all Aeolian chords. Here's what it sounds like using chords just from the Dorian mode for comparison. A lot more, a lot more positive. Um, but the fact is that because the sixth isn't there, theoretically you can use both. So that's really fun to play about with. Um, there's a lot of scope there. I just want to take a step back and point out something I forgot to say before as well. When I was talking about the Mixolydian mode, um, I said that the 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 raised seventh was very un the sorry the major seventh is very uncomfortable and it's flattened in the Mixolydian mode, which means there's not a strong incentive to go from chord seven back to chord one or chord five back to chord one. Because of that, what you tend to find in Mixolydian tunes, a lot of the time you'll get something like this, where you'll have a tune um, that's in the Mixolydian mode up until the very last bar, and then raises the seventh just for the last bar to make it sound finished. Um... Mixolydian. Mixolydian. Mixolydian, major seventh. So there, it's gone C natural all the way through, and then just in the last little bar, it goes like that, um, with a, a C sharp instead. So that's so that you can put your chord five in there and make it sound finished. Um, if you don't do that, it might sound like I did before, like it more wants to resolve back towards G, um, because there's a semitone gap pointing towards G, and there isn't one pointing towards D. So uh, I suspect that's a big part of why you find so many Mixolydian tunes that do that. And maybe that's something that is a more modern flavour that kind of crossed over from other influences like church music. Um, you know, historically. Um, I'm no authority on Scottish music particularly. Um, I know way more Irish tunes. Um, but I know there's certain rhythmic features that you get in Scottish music which you don't get in Irish music. Broadly speaking, it's modal in the same way. The same modes are used. Um, there are certain dances and things like um, strathspeys and so on which you don't get in Irish music. I'm not going to talk about those because I don't know a great deal about them, but there's one really interesting thing, which is the Scotch snap, which is um, a rhythmic feature, which goes da 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 that kind of thing. If you've got a jig in Irish tunes, da da diddle dee, da da diddle dee, you often get quaver, uh, crotchet, and then four quavers, and that makes up the six quavers for your bar. Da 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 da, crotchet, quaver, 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 quaver. <laughs> da 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 diddly. Um, in Scottish music, you get this thing called the Scotch snap or a Lombardic rhythm, which is like um, da 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 dum da 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 dum. So if you hear one of those in a tune, you know it's Scottish and not Irish. There is a huge amount of cro of tunes which have crossed over from Scotland to Ireland because of the the history of the transplantation of. Scots into Ireland um, and there's also a lot of common ground from before the Bretonic nations were kind of split up where they all have similar melodic conventions from that time which have carried on probably um, obviously I don't have any proof but uh, which carried on into the modern day so you can you can kind of trace that um, through there but then over time as well they've also developed little peculiarities and quirks and obviously, um, 
Scottish and Irish music, I suspect, have been less influenced by melodic accompaniment and things which would have come from church music than Welsh music has. If you look at Welsh music, you find much more modern kind of harmony structures where you've got these kind of defined chords in some bars. And you also find things like the melodic minor will crop up, where in a minor key you take your minor chord 5 and you turn it into a major chord so that you've put that major 7th in to make it sound more finished. So if I was writing a Welsh tune in A minor, if I wanted to write a tune that sounded Welsh, um, I might go along in A minor. E minor would be my chord 5, but instead of doing E minor as my chord 5, I'd do E major. And that sounds more finished, because E major's got the, the major 7th, which is G sharp. Um, so that's, that's a very modern thing, um, or, well, I say very modern, I mean it's still, a, you know, the best part of a thousand years, or probably 1,500 years maybe, but um, it's a more modern sounding thing to my ear, and it's not a thing that you find in what I think of as the traditional Celtic sound, um, but it is a thing that you find a lot in Welsh music, and I suspect that's because um, in Wales... Um, the sort of folk tradition was a lot more stamped out and a lot more um, impinged upon by by the state and, and therefore the church and so on. Uh, whereas in Ireland, the music was kind of preserved a bit more. Apparently, I'm, I'm reliably informed by my friend Felix, who knows a lot more about these things than I do, that um, monks went round Ireland collecting tunes with official sanctions to do that. Whereas in Wales, it was like, no completely flat out banned any kind of um, culture as far as I understand it obviously again not a historian um, but anyway so there, there's a lot more kind of little modern features like that um, I think in Welsh music and Breton music is kind of very separate it's got a lot of very different rhythms you do find those kind of more modern melodic features as well but it does also have you can tell it's got a lot of the same kind of roots because a lot of the other conventions are in common with with other Celtic musics. Um, anyway, that's my opinion on it, but it's something that I'll have more time to read up on and study in the future, I hope, because it's super interesting. Donegal music and Scottish very mixed. Yeah, totally, because it's like, well, they're not separated by very far, and then so many people got transplanted from one to the other that the musics have all mixed together. Um, yeah. Um, that's about it for things I wanted to talk about today, and uh, do you know what, from thinking at the start of this that this would be a short one, I seem to have rambled on for absolutely ages, so thank you all for bearing with me. Um, I hope this has been interesting to some of you, and um, if you do want to um, find out more about this kind of stuff, let me know if you find it interesting. Um, I will make some YouTube videos going into a bit more depth with some diagrams and some clearer explanations if this is something that interests people. Um, if you want more info on the practical aspects for guitarists, then um, my first book over there, Backing Guitar Techniques for Traditional Celtic Music, will probably be interesting to you. It's got loads of stuff about um, where to put the chords, how to play the chords, interesting shapes. I'm working on um, a book about chord inversions at the moment, but once that's done, I'll be doing one about how to do the same in Dadgad as well, so keep an eye out for that. Check out folkfriend.co.uk if um, you enjoyed this video and want to find loads more live streams and um, properly edited posh tutorial videos. Loads of good stuff on there, and my books and capos and strings and various things. Um, yeah, I don't have anything much else to say. Thank you very much to uh, Lee Neal for tuning in. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Um, oh, people out there as well, if you have enjoyed this and you are still watching, then hit the uh, like button because uh, that really helps my videos get shown to more people. And obviously subscribe if you like as well, then you'll get um, a free tutorial off me every week and one of these streams if you want to tune in for that as well. Uh, thanks to Chonky. Pleasure as always. Thank you Keith. Thank you, Stephen. Cheers for tuning in. Um, and thank you to all the other people out there in the ether as well. Um, tomorrow afternoon I will have some sort of tutorial out. Um, I haven't actually started filming it yet, which is late even for me. 
because the shop's been open, I haven't had any time, but I will be doing one this evening, so uh, keep an eye out for that tomorrow afternoon. Um, and that's it really, I'll see you all next weekend. Ah, oh, nice one. Thank you, thank you as well to Michael for tuning in.